السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Welcome to the second episode and the last episode in تدبر سورة number 96 which is سورة العلق أو or the clinging forms. Let's review quickly the ayat that we um, contemplated last time. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, اقرأ باسم ربك الذي خلق Recite in the name of your Lord who created خلق الإنسان من علق Created man from clinging forms. اقرأ وربك الأكرم Recite and your Lord is the most noble. الذي علم بالقلم The one who taught by the pen. علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم Taught man what he never knew. And then the next two ayat, which are the first two ayat of our um, episode today. كلا إن الإنسان لا يطغى الرآه استغنى But no, indeed man surely exceeds all limits for he sees himself self-sufficient. We saw in the first five signs of this surah how much do we need Allah for knowledge, for sustenance, for everything. So what can make a person who needs Allah that much transgress and oppress and exceed limits? As Allah says here in this uh, ayah. No, indeed man surely exceeds all limits. Layatoha. Or he sees himself self-sufficient. What makes a person who needs Allah that much transgress and oppress and exceed limits? It is part of human nature that when a person perceives himself or herself as self-sufficient and not in need of anyone, he or she begins to transgress. The term kalla in sign number six, uh, translated but no, indicates reprimand and uh, condemnation. Condemnation of a certain action. And it is logical that it implies condemnation of the feeling of self-sufficiency and complacency just described. When we interpret kalla according to sign number seven, which directly precedes it, we must also note that these signs come after the signs of iqra, or recite, the first five signs, which urge the pursuit of knowledge and the search for all truths. Therefore, what prevents a person from seeking knowledge and searching for the truth is feeling self-sufficient and feeling not in need of Allah. For example, after many advances in medicine, doctors were able to transplant kidneys, hearts, and many organs and replace knee joints and eye lenses, etc. This progress deceived scientists and made some of them raise the slogan of humanism. People don't need a god, they just need a good doctor. Probably for that reason, Allah sent down the novel coronavirus to crush their arrogance and their feeling of self-sufficiency. Then, after a few years, when he supported them and taught them to make vaccines against the virus, they did not thank Allah. Instead, they attributed the success to themselves and insisted on their disbelief. So what happened? He sent down new mutants of the same virus to baffle them and send them back to square one. Another example of this imaginary feeling of self-sufficiency is that a lot of students do not perform prayers, Muslim students do not pray, except during the final exams when they feel the need for Allah's support. But who said that they no longer need him after the results of their exams are released and, and they have passed? It is unfortunate that many of them 
as soon as their desire is fulfilled, transgress and stop praying. Stop remembering Allah. Stop thanking Allah. Even return to commit sins because they feel self-sufficient and not in pressing need of Allah. Allah addresses this in sign number seven when he says, for he sees himself because man is the one who sees himself as self-sufficient and not in need of Allah. But this is a delusion. He just sees himself like that. But it's not true. It's a delusion. He deluded himself like that, actually. Ayah number eight. Inna ila rabbika ruj'a. Indeed, to your Lord is the ultimate return. No, there is a resurrection after death. And we will all return to Allah for judgment, whether we read and seek knowledge from the signs of revelation and from the signs in this world around us, or we don't. We will ultimately return to Allah, all of us. Indeed, we are returning to Allah. We are already on our way back to Him. The next two signs, sign number nine and sign number ten. أَرَأَيْتَ الَّذِي يَنْهَى عَبْدًا إِذَا صَلَّى Have you seen the one who forbids a servant when he prays? These two signs refer to when the Prophet, peace be upon him, was praying in the Haram, Mecca. And then Abu Jahl, Amr ibn Hisham, tried to attack him, which is mentioned in a hadith in Sahih Muslim. Abu Huraira, may Allah be pleased with him, narrated, Abu Jahl asked people whether Muhammad placed his face on the ground in their presence. It was said to him, yes. He said, by Allati wal Uzza, he's swearing by his two idols. If I were to see him do that, I would trample his neck or I would smear his face with dust. He came to Allah's messenger after that and he was engaged in prayer and approached him in order to trample his neck. But suddenly, uh, the people saw him turn upon his heels in fear, trying to repulse something with his hands. It was said to him, what is the matter with you? He said, there is between me and him a ditch of fire and terror and wings. Thereupon, Allah's messenger, peace be upon him, said, if he were to come near me, the angels would have torn him to pieces. However, these signs are not specific about Abu Jahl alone. They should be understood in a broader sense, and that's what tadabbur is about. Contemplation is about that. Put yourself in the ayah. Put yourself in the Quran and see what the Quran is telling you. That is perhaps why Allah did not say, have you seen the one who attacks a servant when he prays? He said, have you seen the one who forbids a servant when he prays? This is because it is quite rare for someone to physically attack Muslims while they are praying, but many people every day forbid Muslims from praying. Like some bosses at work, or school headmasters. So these signs serve as a broader warning to such people. Have you seen if he was rightly guided or commanded to mindfulness of God? Well, now the speech of the Quran shifted, addressing the denier who forbids people from the path of righteousness. Deniers are asked a question that implies exclamation and rebuke. Have you asked yourself what bothers you about those who are on the right path? Here. Have you seen if he was rightly guided? Notice this, the, the grammatical shift, the shift in pronouns. Uh, the two ayat before that. Allah is talking to the Prophet Sallallahu or is talking to the believers, talking to the one who is pondering upon the Quran now, talking to us. Have you seen the one who forbids a servant when he prays? 
and then shifting to address the person who forbids Muslims from praying, asking him, have you seen if he was rightly guided or commanded to mindfulness? See the shift here. Have you asked yourself what bothers you about those who are on the right path? What is bothering you if they pray? And subhanAllah, the Arabic expression, in kana ala al-huda, translated as rightly guided, literally it means if he was on guidance. It likens guidance to a path or a street or a way that a person walks on. And notice this grammatical shift from talking about the disbelievers who forbid Muslims from praying to addressing them directly to their faces in this sign. Have you seen if he was rightly guided or commanded to mindfulness? Those who pray command themselves to piety for prayer forbids obscenity. And what is deplorable? Prayer forbids obscenity and what is deplorable. So why does the forbidder feel agitated that one being forbidden is on the path of guidance or that he commands himself to be pious? And here the sign includes that by forbidding a person to pray, one is actually forbidding everything in which there is righteousness and piety. And mindfulness of Allah, just as there are those who forbid others to uh, pray, there are those who forbid the arbitration of Allah's legislation, Sharullah, Shariatullah. Thus, the sign broadens the picture into one that is much more general, not just someone who forbids people from praying. No, it it has become all too prevalent in society, where people actually command what is deplorable and forbid what is fair. Let's take sign number 13 and 14. Have you seen if he disbelieved and turned away? Has he not realized that Allah sees? This sign bears two possible meanings. First is that the speech turned to the Prophet, peace be upon him, and to the believer who is reading and pondering upon the Quran and says to him, have you seen this denier who forbids prayer? He does this because he denies the existence of Allah or the oneness of Allah or the resurrection and reckoning after death and has turned away from Allah's religion? Did he not know that Allah sees? What makes a person transgress in this way is that he is ignorant and does not know that Allah sees everything and that he does, uh, you know, he sees, uh, that Allah sees everything that he does and will, and, and will hold him accountable for everything he does. But another possible meaning is that the speech did not shift and is still directed at the deniers, the disbeliever who forbids people from praying and says to him, what bothers you about the worshippers' piety to Allah? Do you not know if he denied the hereafter like you and turned away from it like you, and abandoned prayer like you, he will have a difficult reckoning? Is he unaware that Allah sees everything? If he does the same as you and abandons prayers, then he doubts that Allah sees him and will judge him. Therefore, the sign carries an indirect admonition to those who forbid people to pray as well not just addressing the believers. Ayah number 15 and number 16. Kalla la illam yantahi la nasfa'an bin nasiyah, nasiyatin kathibatin khati'ah. 
But no, surely if he does not desist, we will drag him by the forelock. A lying, wrongful forelock. As previously mentioned, the word kalla, which is translated as but no, is used for reprimand and condemnation. That is, no to forbidding people from praying, no to hindering people from the way of Allah. If a person keeps preventing people from the way of Allah and forbidding them from praying, we will drag him by the forelock. The forelock is the lock of hair just above the, the forehead. And the Arabic term, yasfa' lanasfa'am bin nasiyah, Yes, translated here as drag, actually has several meanings, including dragging or pulling someone from his forelock, which is very insulting and humiliating, but is um, a deserved payment for uh, uh, the one who used to humiliate the believer and threaten him to prevent him from praying. Yes, fat can also mean hitting or slapping. Hitting or slapping. The question here is, why did Allah indicate slapping or hitting on the forehead rather than the cheek, which would have been more insulting? Slapping someone like that is more insulting than this. Actually, Mufassirin said that describing the forelock as lying and wrongful is a cynic doki, uh, meaning that the person to whom this forelock belongs is the liar and the wrongful one. Okay, so cynic doki is when you speak about a part of the body, but you're speaking about the person himself, like saying a lying tongue. It means a lying person. The person is a liar. It also means that this lying and wrongdoing originate on the forelock. And therefore, this forelock is worthy of being slapped. Indeed, science has discovered that that part of the brain underneath the forelock is known as the frontal cortex. And it is responsible for controlling problem solving. It is also responsible for making decisions to either lie or be truthful to solve problems, to be fair or unfair, to solve your problems. Scientists discovered that the frontal lobe is responsible uh, for higher cognitive functions such as memory, emotions, impulse control, problem solving, social interaction, and motor function. Thus, the area underneath the forelock is the human decision-making area. However, there are those who are somewhat confused by this sign because it mentions the forelock being wrongful. It mentions being wrongful as a sin. However, the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, Allah has forgiven my nation for mistakes and forgetfulness and what they are forced to do. This is an established Islamic principle where Allah does not hold accountable or punish uh, for a mistake. And the sign says that Abu Jahl made a mistake. His forelock is wrongful, makes mistakes. So does this not require that Allah not hold him accountable? Because Allah forgives mistakes. The answer is that the hadith talks about a mistake, not a sin. For the mistake is unintentional while the sin is intentional. Whoever makes a mistake is called muhti' falter. But whoever commits a sin, such as Abu Jahl, is called khati' wrongful, or wrongdoer. So the wrongdoer, khati' the, the falter, or the one who makes mistakes, muhti' Ayah number 17 and number 18, فَلْيَدْعُ let him call on his gang. We will call the guards of hell. These signs were also revealed about Abu Jah. Amr ibn Hisham. 
these two signs as well. Ibn Abbas narrated, the Prophet was performing prayer when Abu Jahl came to him and said, have I not forbidden you from this? Have I not forbidden you from this? Have I not forbidden you from this? The Prophet turned and scolded him. So Abu Jahl said, you know that no one has more to call for assistance than me, which means I am the most followed person. I have a lot of fans. I have a lot of people who, who can, who can uh, defend me, protect me. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed. Let him call on his gang. We will call the guards of hell. So Ibn Abbas said, by Allah, if he had called his counsel, then the guards of hell would have seized him. That is, Abu Jahl said to the Prophet, peace be upon him, did I not for prevent you from praying several times? And the Prophet ﷺ rebuked him and left him. So Abu Jahl got angry and threatened him that he could gather the leaders of Mecca and, and from the clubs to punish the Prophet ﷺ. Allah responded to him if, that if that happens, he will call the guards of hell. And the Arabic term is Zabaniya, which is translated here as guards of hell. The word Zabaniya also refers in Arabic for bodyguards. Bodyguards who protect a ruler and push people away from him so that people do not gather in crowds around him. So Allah named the angels who will push the people and throw them into hell because they prevented people from praying the bodyguards of the one who prays. Those are the body, your bodyguards, O Muhammad. And then Allah told him, Kalla, la tuti'hu wasjud wa qatarib. But no, do not obey him, but prostrate yourself and draw near. It's like Allah is telling every Muslim, put yourself in the ayah. The ayah is not only addressing Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Every Muslim who has been told not to pray, do not obey those who forbid you from praying. Salvation lies in closeness to Allah, not in distancing yourself from Allah. And closeness to Allah is achieved through prostration. The Messenger of Allah said, the closest a servant comes to his Lord is when he is prostrating himself. So make supplication often when you are prostrating. In summary, the issue is a matter of choosing between serving Allah and serving this materialistic world. Either you worship Allah or you worship desires and materialism and the materialistic way of life. Whoever submits himself to Allah frees himself from the shackles of materialism, frees himself from the shackles of this world. And here in this ayah, Wasjud waqtarib in some masahif, you will find a line over the word wasjud because this is the last prostration of recitation. Sajdat tilawa. There is something something called sajdat at tilawa, sujud at tilawa, which is a sujud that we make when we are reading certain things. There are fifteen sajda in the Quran, in most madhabs. The sunnah is actually uh, to say sajda wajhi lilladhi khalaqahu wa sawwarah wa shakka sam'ahu wa basarah bi hawlihi wa quwwatih my face prostrated to the one who created it and created its hearing and its sight with his might and power jazakumullah khairan barakallahu fikum like that we finished surah uh, al-alaq and inshallah, we see you in the next halqa. Uh, Assalamu alaikum.